looking at trying to cope with all the milk, eh, from that to bring all the milk in. You want heart, things go on, things go out normally. Yeah, we start normal. Yeah, eight to not to come come alive. It's cope with all, from that to bring all, eh, to live with all, high to milk with it. Are you guys all keeping up so far? <laughs> <laughs> so my true name is Tita Hema. My English name is Rebecca Duncan. I come from both the Squamish and the Musqueam nations. It is an honor to welcome you all to our sacred territory here, what we call Kam Kam Alai. Can everybody say that? Kam Kam Alai. So Kam Alai is one maple tree. Kam Kam Alai is many maple trees, lots. And this is what we name the Vancouver area. It's a general name. If you've been on the highway up to Squamish, and you'll see the signage coming back named Kam Kam Alai. Calling Vancouver that. So the big groves were over at the foot of Gore and Main Street, all that area where the shipyards are now. Uh, so it's come, come alive. Yes, and uh, shared by, of course, of the three local nations here Musqueam, Skokomish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, I'd like to honor each and every one of you, all of us, as we come out of this horrific. Uh, pandemic and you know we're still still a little bit sketchy out there so I'd really like to honor all of our spirits and um, continue on with strength endurance perseverance all that we have all the teachings you know from our ancestors wear those with pride wear your armor um, you know that's that's your teachings that's who you are your identity so uh, I'd like to sing the Squamish warrior song there's a part in here in the break where I'm going to lift my hand and I ask each and every one of you to lift your hands with me just to honor your own spirit, yourself, your strength. I will see Writing what, you ask? 
monologues. You see, this was previously my life's list, but as of late, it has pushed its way over. To the audience. I used to hate writing, and then I don't mind it so much. But now my hands, they don't want to work like they used to. So I'm beginning to hate that too. I have to do this. I agree to do this. Why in the hell do I do that? Oh yeah, I have to live. They are paying me to do this. Some silly ass theater company commissioned me. So get to it. Typing on the computer. You know how there are some things that certain people just aren't good at. Writing monologues is one of those things for me. My granddaughter says, if someone were to ask you to write a thousand page paper on the psychological effects of environment and geographical locations on Inuit individuals under the age of 30, yet above the age of 16, she would be ecstatic. There are cold hard facts, right and wrong answers, and plenty of published journals to research, but instead they ask me to write a series of monologues on a topic of my choice with no right and no wrong answers. Not so easy. To the audience and herself. What makes them think I can actually do this? The censor screams so loudly. It's impossible to drown them out. They get louder and louder and each advancing step of the process. Typing on her computer. You see, with the monologue, you want to be creative and be able to find a good topic to write about. Myself, I'm good at thinking up topics but then you have to think of witty things to say and clever ways to say them. Now I'm stuck. If I try to proceed past this first couple of lines, I think I've screwed it up. I scrunch it into a ball and become focused. My ruined monologue as a basketball. I turn radio to static, to a crowd cheering and slam dunk it into the garbage can. To the audience and herself. It's not that, not that I don't have hope, that I don't hope I can do it. Heck, I've got a whole trunk full of hopes. It's just the censors. They're incessant. Hope and censors, constantly fighting for my headspace, constantly arguing, fighting to overpower each other. Ah, now there's a good outtake, a story blooper, as I call to them. Hmm, I've got to write it down while it's still fresh in my mind. Now where is that old blooper folder again? Typing on the computer. The censor screams so loudly. It's near impossible to drown their incessant screech. Their message screaming so loudly in my ears. You can't. Drowning that ever soft voice of you can. The can tries so hard to push its way through, but its voice becomes so weak. It's raspy crackle of positiv positivity so strained. The censors become louder at every corner. The can pushes so pu pushes so hard, or the can pushes so hard and finds the smallest instance of hope to hold on to. The hope so faintly it bar barely is able to hold the hand of a can. Its fingers outstretched. The fingertips are rough and grasping for a hold of the can. The soft, smooth, childlike fingers of the can slips, but quickly regain the grip. The sensors are pushing back with the other hand of hope. The rough cracks in the working hands of hope catch the pointy edges of can't, and they puncture the hand of hope. Hope bleeds. Hope's bloody calloused hands pushes with the might of a lifelong lie while the tandem pulling up the hand of the can. The pull and push tries the hand of hope, but it refuses to let go. The can pulls higher and higher until it's at the same level as the sensors. The sensors points have to hope gushing blood and it sticks its claws deeper into the hopes and twists. Hope is overcome. It's blood spewed over the sensors and spills over onto the hand of the can. Hope drives slowly to a stop and it feels the weight of death knocking on Re Relam's door. The sensor digs its claws into once more and twists so hard the doors to Realm is open to the force of can't. Hope fails, and its body lies heavenly upon the censors and the can. To audience. Okay, okay. I have to do this. Do this. Do the damn thing they're paying me to do. No more side adventures to write my bloops. Okay, back to the other file. Where is it? God damn it. Typing on computer. I think some people just weren't meant to write long 
parades of words in clever and witty ways, and I might just be the captain of that club. Now it's not just the writing aspect of the whole ordeal, but after you do finally complete something. Or, in other words, pay my brother five bucks to write. Then people will want to read it. Some of them go as far as to make you read it yourself. That'll be a cold day in hell. After the embarrassment of reading something you just wrote that wasn't based on cold hard facts and rights and wrong answers, you want to look in their faces. Go to hell. Typing on computer. The hidden smirks, the shifty eyes, and the tone of their voices that, that secretly say, that was brilliant, brilliantly dumb. Now, if you are strong enough to have stayed in the room and you haven't started tearing up yet, which believes me it's hard to do, you have to go on living the absolute rest of your life dreaming of ways it could have been better. Or what of those people were thinking behind your judgmental eyes? You begin hiding your face when passing those who heard it thinking. Please don't say anything. Please, please. To the audience. So what is it I despise so much about writing monologues? Having to watch it after. It's not like a story or a paper when you never have to see the reader. She gets up from the computer slowly with her old creaky body and mauls about her apartment, tidying but really just moving stuff around. She pours herself another cup of coffee. That's why I shot all my censors. I kill someone in every piece I write. Die, censors, die. I killed Rusty twice. She killed herself and she was the biggest silencing of all. I couldn't figure it out why she was murdered. Why she murdered herself. So I wrote the story and killed her again. Then I was watching a soap opera and killed her again. Dead people do nothing. They are boring. They aren't even there. The casket has a body, but they have left. The aliveness is gone. The doing something tomorrow is gone. The laughters, the tears, even the crap people put you through is gone. The conversation is dead. The conversation in yourself dies until you kill them again. No censors. Death to them all. You can kill them with just a little too. You can kill them just a little too and leave them alive, emptied of their authority, especially if they believe they have power and control over you. You just kill their authority. Become the authority, the author of, the, of your own story. A big fuck you, you empty sack of shit. The hope returns. The laughter comes back and my own con conversation bubbles up. The words return. Words are sacred and they need to be alive and well. Someone once said that writing an essay, you just open a vein and bleed all over the typewriter, or in this case, a computer. It's kind of like digging a ditch and playing in the muck. Only the ditch is full of your own crappy memories, feelings, or something deadly piece of fiction that might show something, someone something about themselves. But then you remember, they are looking at you, looking right inside of you, picturing that this is you, this is the real you, the one you never wanted anyone to see. You can see the reaction in their eyes. Writing is like stripping yourself bare and reading it. Performing it is like running around on stage all naked, your guts hanging out, and everyone out there judging whether or not you look good. Me, I think humans are kind of funny looking, all bony and gangly. Boobs hanging out, butts sagging, arms flailing. I mean, they are not bunnies, all cute and cuddly. All the muck, well, it's full of our folly, riddled with all our ill behavior. And then the judges have their own ditch full of dirt. Then I remember that words, sound and rhythm, the very speaking to all that I am, the readdressing of who I am is what counts. I love the notion of tomorrow because it is complete bullshit. Tomorrow I will be perfect is a promise I can always keep because tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow is like time, a beautiful and satisfying illusion. It allows us to lie quite, quite guilt, guiltlessly to ourselves, our children, our friends, everyone. Tomorrow I will wake up and all these wrinkles will be gone. The arthritis in my fingers will disappear. The greatest story that ever lived will pour from my perfect hands. I will be a genius, loved by all. Everyone will want to be me, tomorrow. 
but today I will peck away at this machine, conjure another cluster of words, dreaming some dream for some character that needs to be on the page. Someone who otherwise no one would ever see, ever get to know, will be born, and they will be perfect. They will do exactly as I instruct them to do. They will look like I want them to look. Love me the way I want to be loved. Treat me the way I want to be treated, or I will kill them. Turn them into the worst trolls, perverts, killers, assholes. Better watch out how you are around me. You might find yourself in the story. Their judgments don't actually matter. What matters is the digging. All I have to do is mark off the moments of heroism, of failure, of success, of joy, and of rage. I can do it any way I want. I will just create images that are me and at the same time, not me. I will razzle them with dazzle, baffle them with bullshit, if I can't think of anything else. The only thing really perfect in life is a finished story or a complete sentence. Maybe that is what scares me. I can do anything. Maybe I fear the very freedom of speaking, of imagining, altering my story. Who was that woman who said something about that? Fearing the light. Doesn't matter. Maybe it's a little bit of magical life living in the muck. Maybe it's finding the light in all the dark mud. Maybe it's the turning of the muck, seeing it all paradoxically. I can hate it but I am obsessed with doing it. Dig, dig, dig. I plunge my shovel into the muck, rake it forward, and examine its texture, its color, its effects, its coming into being, its transformation. I look at the fragment of life in it, the stories within stories of each morsel of mud, and soon I am lost in the magic of rolling around my own insides. Me, the judges are still there, still perched on their fences, sitting down at me, blah, blah, blahing about me. At first they took pristine, starched, and important. I stare at them. They transform from people with options I care about to censors shutting me up. You're not go good enough. Who do you think you are? Their voices are loud, strident, almost fearful. I stare at them as they block my entry into the world. I am staring with the new intent. I fiction them up. The perches they sit on begin to look old and frail, like half-broken fences. Who do I think I am? Who the hell do they think they are? I put an old post and the lot of them tumbling to the ground. Now I am looking down at them. That's when I realize I can shut the judges up. I can't turn them off, mute the sound button. I do not need to listen to them. Last night I had a great idea, but this was morning. Oh, but this morning it up and left. When I was young, I stayed up for a great idea. Nothing else. Well, maybe a sick kid, but nothing else. No party, no man. Nothing could keep me up when I wanted to go to bed, except a great idea. I even went to the machine, but as soon as I got there, my eyes closed. I woke and staggered to bed. I am just not good anymore. No matter, how, no matter how great they say I am, I can't write like I used to. My hands won't work anymore. I remember writing novels, hundreds of pages. All the things I've done seem so far away now. When did the great ideas just up and walk away out on me? Haha, uh -huh. that's a Patsy Cline song for writers in that one. My monologues fall to pieces. Each time I go to sleep, I try and I try but I cannot think. My memory has moved out. Look at that fucking cup. It's half off the edge of the fucking table. I just need to swing this kimono when I walk by and my last fucking cup will be busted. Plenty more where they come from. Screw coffee cups. I used to have some beauties, all matching, standing up at attention in a cupboard full of matching glassware and dishes. I busted them, one at a time. Shouldn't throw fancy dishes in the sink. She walks back and sits down at her computer. But that wasn't the point. The point is, I have to finish this. Maybe a coffee would do it. Nah, just write the damn thing. I used to be strong enough to handle their criticism, but now these days, I just don't have the energy. Staring at her computer. It's all so familiar. 
It feels like I've said this all before. Well, it is the same bunch of words. Same old, same old. How do your flowers grow? Same old, same old. Tell me you love me true. Was I thinking coffee? What am I doing here? The wind was blowing through the crab shack. Sounds familiar? Did I write this before? How do I know if this is what I've said before? Have I said it? Or do I just think that I've said it? Everything is a blur. I just can't do it. I shouldn't do this. This one last try. Is that what I am doing? Or was I just chatting with myself? Oh, fuck. I can't remember. How am I supposed to figure it out? Was anyone here? When did they leave? How did I get here? Is this just a dream? Where the fuck am I? I hardly recognize this place. Brilliantly dumb. That's a good beginning. The old lady was brilliantly dumb. Now that she has Alzheimer's. I like looking through people's holiday photos. I love it when they post them up on Facebook, Instagram, even the little montages on Reels or TikTok. It's kind of like driving around at night in the good part of town, peeking in the windows of the rich, you know, just to be nosy. It's also like looking through a first-hand vacation magazine. You can decide whether you want to go there based on the insider photos from someone's personal gallery. I get upset when I realize they've only put one photo as their profile picture. Who the fuck wants to see you? Show me some scenery. I love photos. They capture the best pretense in humans. The smile almost looks real. But then you see one of those candid shots when the person wasn't looking. And you know how bogus all those Facebook photos really are. Bogus and beautiful. Some of them are brag photos. You and some famous person you manage to corner and say, can I have a picture taken with you? Of course they're going to say yeah. So the famous person is trying to look genuinely happy to have a photo taken with you, but fails ever so slightly. It's hilarious. But you, you are happier than a pig in a poke. Reminds me of when Morgan Freeman said, good morning, ma'am, to me. I never thought of taking a picture of him doffing his hat at me, to me at 6 a.m. on Beverly Street in Toronto. I was 55 years old, still riding a bike. I hope I can still ride when I'm 80. He pops out of a trailer. I stop, he looks, doffs his hat and says, morning, ma'am, just like we're old friends. All I can think of is, good morning, Morgan. So I say it and guess what goes off in my mind. I'm going to make my friends so jealous. I'm going to tell everybody I didn't feel the least bit pathetic. <laughs> Why am I talking about Morgan? I think I got off the subject. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, Facebook. Don't really work it much, though I have a lot of friends. Love looking at them, the photos. When I first got Facebook, I didn't know how to use it, so I started another account. Now I have two accounts. I rarely use either. Just look at the pictures every once in a while. I think last time I wrote something on the wall was last Christmas. I guess I have no idea what social networking is all about. I'm just not that social. And that was before the pandemic. And I just don't get that network. Can't wrap my mind around it. She reaches over and flicks on the radio. A Patsy Klein song is playing. She quickly gets up and starts swaying, dancing around her apartment. I love to dance. So does my granddaughter. I wonder if she loves the flow of air moving swiftly around her body. I like to feel as light as a feather. When I dance, I feel like there's nothing wrong with the world and everything will wait for me. I feel like everything really can be perfect. Her father doesn't like her to dance. He doesn't like that she gets so carefree and wild, as he calls it. He says that dance makes her act like she doesn't care about anything and that she should be spending her time on better things, always saying to her in an exasperated and raspy tone as she leaves the house, Kido Nimmin Tap, I'm not good with Cree. <laughs> what a grump! <laughs> Basically, a censor. Censoring Nusham, I won't have it. She doesn't really find anything else interesting. 
She loves the way her feet ache after a good rehearsal, pulling them out of her jigging shoes, the ringing in her ears from her troop's firm claps of the basic step and brushes of tap shoes on the stage. She loves feeling strong and powerful, loves how her long legs feel when she's jumping in the puffy ruffled skirt. The long and hard hours spent at the community hall practicing, the feeling of being invincible. Her mother loves it when she dances too. Says she looks like an angel or a papillon. She can never make up her mind. She spends hours picking out just the right bodysuit to practice in, even though she loves them all. Mom is always looking out for her fee. I'm glad she likes dancing. <coughs> she does powwow dancing too, but my girl, she loves the Red River jig. I'm glad she's keeping our traditions alive. Everything is about dance, if you think about it. Vibrations, stellar vibrations, star nation vibrations, the body vibrates, the earth has a rhythm. Sound is lyrical or off key, strident or melodious. I like a steady beat with a melody floating over top that makes you ride into another world. Hippie out, everybody. Move. <laughs> not, so, not so much now, though. Used to be I could dance all day and night. They used to have twisting contests. I won every time. Shuffle, shuffle, shake your booty. These days, I'm lucky to shake over too much coffee. <laughs> Powwow music comes on the radio. <laughs> My favorite is the leaps in the fancy shawl. The splits in midair, crazy comment on life. That's what dance is. A crazy commentary about life. Leaping is risk taking. Stepping is reaching for the stars. Look at me. Well, maybe not anymore. Sometime around 60, I seized up. Just cannot stretch out like I used to. Even women's traditional is too much for me these days. My knees just don't work quite right. So don't look at me. I don't care, though. I'm still, I still turn on the music and give it a whirl. Dance my way through life. Dance my way through trouble. The other day, my granddaughter came by. She's out of high school and can't, I can't believe it. Even my goddamn Nushimik are old. She starts yammering away about going to college. Ugh, Ugh Kukum. It is my senior year in high school. Everybody's talking about where they're gonna go to university or college, what education they're gonna get, how many guys they're gonna sleep with in their first year. Now you can just guess what my mom said. You'll get an education. There is no damn doubt about it. Now go to your room and study. Huh. I'll show her. I, I dedicated my entire last year of high school to purposely not getting good marks. It's skipping class. Hard as I tried, it didn't work. Mom somehow got the scouts to come out to one of my jigging performances to see if I was good enough to qualify for their oh-so-prestigious dance school. They loved me. Fuck. Full scholarship. Fuck. <laughs> Room and board included. Fuck. On-campus job with a premium reserved parking spot. Fuck. There was no escaping it. My damn mum got me. You may have won this time, mum, but we'll see you next time. Imitating her daughter. I pretend not to be excited. So what? Okay. Maybe I'm a little bit excited. I really do love to dance, but I don't want to learn anything that isn't dance related. But I have to have a non-dance minor, I googled. I googled, what is the easiest degree to get at university? Good old Google. They always have the answer. Writer. Hmm. A writer. <laughs> Sounds easy enough. So back to the guide, and sure enough, there it is, a little old writing degree. After reading the section on it, well, I thought it would be the easiest thing in the world to do. Perfect. Ha! <laughs> Hawa. Was she in for a surprise? Surgery is easier. I'd rather cut the liver from a person, but eliminating a precious line? Can't do it. So I have a system. 
If I have to take something out of a story, I call it an outtake, kind of a story blooper, and see if it wants to grow up to be another story or poem one day. One year I wrote a novel from all the pages and pages of outtakes. Quirky? Mm, yeah. But words for me are sacred. The moment we utter them, we breathe thousands of years of life into them. Picture this. Millions upon millions of people have been using these same words in a different way, their own way, for thousands of years, conjuring, story, song, dance, music, love, hate, war, peace, dinner, dinner even from them. Exciting? Yeah, there is excitement in dance, but the dance of language is the ultimate fulfillment. People give you stories. Stories come to you. I can find them in the oddest places, like the shopping mall, the bus. Yesterday, some crazy pair of pregnant ladies are on the bus. One starts screaming at the guy the other one is with and says, so this is why you didn't call. You have two women knocked up at the same time, you bastard. She starts hitting him. He asks her to stop. The other woman wants to know, what is she talking about? He runs off the bus at the nearest stop. Two screaming women after him. No university is going to give you a story like that. <laughs> but I don't say anything. I really don't like getting advice. I'm not an advice kind of, an advice taking kind of person. I'm fine giving advice though, whether I know anything about the topic or not. I get uncomfortable when someone is giving me pointers on what to do or what I should have done. I have it stuck in my head that I know better, even if deep down I know they're right. That being said, I'm actually quite good at giving advice to others. Myself, I'm one of those people that, can't make up a, that can make up a whole story about a topic I've never heard anything about before and make it so believable that you would seriously consider taking the advice I give you on the topic. You might even pass along bits of my story to your friends when in a similar conversation. I don't know how I do it. The words just start flowing out of my mouth. I could talk forever about any topic given to me. Maybe I should have gone into improv. Eh, those freelance improv actors, they make too much money anyways. Maybe I just like to hear myself talk. I think that's what most people think. Maybe I do, but who even knows for sure? Advice is the cheapest of all communication that takes place between humans. If I gathered up all the advice I've been given, I couldn't even exchange it for a cup of coffee. Advice is one of those things we all want to get rid of. No one will buy it, so we give it away. I rarely use my own advice, let alone someone else's. Used to have a sign that said, take my advice. I'm not using it. Loved that sign. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Advice is the worst. Maybe it's more that I want to know better. Maybe I know I'm not bent in the direction the advisor is trying to send me. Maybe I secretly believe that doing it different doesn't necessarily change the outcome. Besides, I'm a persuasive bullshitter and I prefer my fiction to most realities. Endless creativity is far more entertaining than doing the same old, same old. And people appreciate me for it. I don't really listen to myself all that much, but I do love talking. Half the time, I don't even remember what I said. One time I was teaching a class. This girl has her journal open. Can I read it? Sure, she says. I read the paragraph. I read it. The paragraph is poignant, pithy, and beautiful. Wow, I say, this is brilliant. It should be, she says. You said it. Oh, for Pete's sakes, I answer. Don't write down what I say. Write what you think. She takes a minute to straighten out her apartment, has a sip of her coffee, and gazes out the window. I think the best part of being in your 20s is having the world in your hands. You're young enough to still act crazy and do whatever you want, and old enough to be treated like a contributing member of society. My favorite part of my 20s was the parties. I loved going to swanky parties at secret locations, 
drinking beer straight from the keg. I remember when I was 21, I was at this party. It was absolutely huge. Everyone I knew must have been there. I'd never been to a kegger before. It was so much fun. So many super cute girls and way too drunk boys. I'm not even sure how people made it home after the party. The beer was always cheap, like so cheap that even if you couldn't afford food, you could always afford a sixer. Anyways, at that party when I was 21, I met this girl named Carrie. She seemed really cool. We got talking and next thing you know, we're in the kitchen doing keg stands. What a blast. I had no idea that beer would taste so different when drank in an upside down position. <laughs> Maybe that's just because once they open the tap, it comes out so fast, your taste buds don't have time to react. But who knows? Anyways, we got drunk, real drunk. Drunker than I'd ever been before. We were yelling and dancing, chatting with the boys, but paying the most attention to each other. We went upstairs with these guys to smoke a bit. We were all huddled in the corner smoking. Then Andy, and I think his name was, leaned on the window and it popped open. We all crawled out onto the roof. The next thing you know, we're singing so loud and jumping up and down, having the time of our lives. Fuck, it was fun. I can't believe no one called the cops. We were so loud. See, we were all having such a good time up there and we were all so drunk. Me and Carrie, we were spinning, doing that thing like they did in that movie, My Fair Lady. I think it was My Fair Lady, or else some other movie. That thing where you crisscross your arms and grab each other's hands and spin around and around. Well, we were spinning real fast and laughing real hard. I guess all the spinning got to my head and I started to feel like I was going to puke. Through, through my laughing, I tried to tell Carrie to stop spinning because I had to yak, but I guess she didn't hear me. I felt it coming up and I couldn't hold it in anymore. I let go of Carrie's hands and turned around and threw a ball over the roof. As I finished emptying my stomach, I heard a crunching noise. I turned around. I guess we'd been spinning for a while and we didn't realize that we were moving so close to the edge of the roof. I guess what, was, what happened was that me and Carrie were spinning real close and when I let her go to throw up, the momentum from spinning spun her one last time right over the edge. I looked over the side of the building. My girl Carrie was lying on the ground six stories down. She wasn't moving. I shouted, but she didn't answer. The guys we were smoking with took off as soon as they realized what happened. I wanted to go too, but I was so drunk I couldn't get up and run with them. I guess it was a good thing I didn't end up running. Probably wouldn't have looked too good. I sat on the roof crying and crying. The police and everyone eventually came. They called my parents who came and got me. I don't remember much of the rest of the night. I just remember Carrie. I remember that she was beautiful. When someone good dies, it's tragic. Tragedy sucks. At the same time, it weaves its way through you like a snake, collecting all the trash, pulling all the feelings you have, and creating a delicate, lacy cloth, a shroud of stories, flowers of being, conjuring the best emotions inside us, deepening our sense of love. I had a friend called Rusty. She was my sister, my mother, my best friend, all rolled into one. She was fun and funny, but her life was tragic. She was a train about to be derailed. If she hadn't have killed herself, some fucked up guy would have done it for her. I know that now, but I didn't know it when it happened. We partied with others by ourselves. We drank ourselves into oblivion on more than one occasion. And somehow the hangovers were all worth it. I felt like she was there to plant seeds of all the emotions I now have. It takes a lot of feeling to write a story. Writers have to be fearless in the feeling of the story, fearless in the conjuring, fearless in the expression. We have to face death the tragic and the deserving kind of death. If the character is an asshole, the death is not so bad. But if it's tragic, then people who experience the story grow a feeling. Grow a feeling, all you fucking censors. Grow a feeling, all you bastards. 
After Carrie died, I didn't quite know what to do. I'd only just met her, although I didn't have any real ties to her. I was still sad she died. I think I stayed in my room for a month. I only came out for necessities. That's kind of like now. Now that I'm old, I don't go out anymore. When I was shut up in that room, I sat, I laid, and I cried. Nothing seemed to help me get over what happened. While I was lying there one day, I went to the typewriter and began to write. I wrote and wrote and wrote. It seemed to help me get all the feelings I was having out. It was like a private confession that no one would be able to identify as mine. From that first point, I felt like I had to write, like I needed to, like there was no other option. So I wrote all month long until I felt I was capable of leaving my room. When I came out, I felt as though I'd really let my feelings out. I felt so much better. I could see the flowers. Since that day, I've been obsessed with writing. I compulsively journaled. I cataloged, kept all of my to-do lists. I couldn't stop writing. Everywhere I go and everything that's happened to me, I had to document. See what you started, Carrie? I even write poetry, and it's the worst. Ibsen called poetry his tarantula in a jar. <coughs> Excuse me. He'd starved the thing for a long time. Then, just as it was about to die, he had to feed it. He had to write. Writers don't choose to write stories. Stories are looking around trying to find a writer. When they do, they get inside and nothing will appease them but for the person carrying the story to get up and get it out. When someone dies, a piece of me prays that their stories escape just before the spirit leaves their body. I pray that the story is flying around the atmosphere, looking for someone to swallow it and write it down. I want to be the one who captures the stories of all our dead. That way they keep on living. I imagine, who told me this story or that story? Like this one is for Carrie. My tarantula is really a worm. He wriggles inside, conjures sun, moon, stars, journeys across the whole universe. I imagine him as the first being in the star world. See him flying off the original, being in space that conjured the universe of planets, stars, and beings. He flew through the galaxies and landed in the water here. He was so lonely, he started reproducing different but the same, generation after generation. He changed from worm to snake to lizard to dinosaur to bird to human. I think that first worm was two spirit. We are born with that story and will always want to story up some journey, some fiction and some myth to satisfy our own wanderlust. The words are coming easier. What a relief. Relief is one of the best feelings in life. Going through the most stressful experience of your life and coming out on the other side in one piece, that's relief. While you're caught up in all the madness, it feels like your mind is splitting into shards. Like the impulse control you once had over the direction your thoughts take is gone. You flushed it down some metaphorical shitter and you're absolutely convinced it will never return. The lines you once knew, the words you found so easy to access are gone. You want to kill something, hit something, but there is no one to blame. Then senses wash over you, the disaster ends and relief comes, dragging all the words with it. Your thoughts are restored. The impulse control center of your brain is back in charge. Gotta love it. Fuck Alzheimer's. I'm making up stories. I met a friend for a drink the other day. She was with her new beau of the month. He brought along his best friend, a lesbian I somehow had never met. As I walked down the stairs to the table where they were sitting, my friend introduced me as a writer. Of all the other things I do, why would she choose to introduce me as a writer? I asked why she introduced me that way. She said, I just want to support you. You're my friend. I, uh, her stating out loud to people that I had just met that I was a writer got me thinking. All I could think about for the rest of the evening was, how do writers act? Should I have more important things to say? Should I behave more pretentiously? 
The persona of writer confuses me. It's an unfamiliar role. Now, I'm not sure the proper way to act or what the proper things to say are, but it made me feel important. Although the general writer is, a, is stereotyped as underpaid, I focused on the dreamy side of the stereotype. The long nights, the smoking inside coffee shops, cups and cups of black coffee, their quiet resolutions and handsomely romantic lives lived out in small apartments with dim lighting and plenty of neutral colored throw pillows. Can I really be like that? I wondered. Maybe. The lack of human contact and improper interpersonal skills are definitely there. <laughs> I guess so. A writer. I wondered if I would have to stop drinking so many rosy wines and switch to the standard neat whiskey in a short stout glass. I figured I'd figure that one out later. The waiter came to our table and I ordered a whiskey in a short stout glass. We spent the evening drinking and chatting and smoking. I tried out my new personality. We had an all right time. Nothing too exciting happened, but just as I was about to leave, the guy's friend, this lesbian that I somehow didn't know, came up to me and said that I seemed real interesting. That, se that I seemed mysterious and she thought my writings must be exquisite just by the way I held myself. Wow, you can imagine my surprise. This was the highlight of my night. My new persona was believable. And I got a hook on one of the newest babes in town. Maybe I can live with this. First time someone said I was a writer, and I believed it, I said, nope, I am an alcoholic that can't afford to drink. Too many kids, so writing is the cheapest high I could find. <laughs> Besides, I didn't have the courage to conjure a persona like I saw the other writers do. What happens if I drink scotch like Farley, or hang out in bars like Timothy, or live on the Riviera like Peggy? I'll have to conjure story, not from that place of where the story finds me, but I would have to plan a story, write an outline, research my subject, and try to string together the best words linked perfectly. I would have to focus on transitions, flow, and rhythm. Shit, I would have to study metaphor. <laughs> nah, not a writer. I own the machine, the computer, and the stories I kick out know this. They lurk around in my backyard, skulking about, wait, skulking about waiting for me to pass by. They pounce on me as I bend the corner, fumble with my keys. They worm their way inside and then start barking around like they have something to say. I resist them for a while, but then they interrupt my sleep and I get up and write. Damn bastards. <laughs> Anyone who listens to the pulse of the universe looks at the stars and wonders about journey, about being, about action, and its play on the soul, the heart, can be a writer. But the best stories are the magic ones that find you, the ones that want to be told, have to be told, and won't accept any other teller than you. You have to be listening for it, really open to hearing it. If only those damn stories would come often and fast enough, then I wouldn't have to work. <laughs> I hate working. <laughs> That's why I never worked a job I didn't love. I mean, work can be every day. Think about it. Eight hours every day. One third of your life committed to some dude, some company, some place that is going to make everybody else very rich and you very time constricted. Every job eventually becomes a routine, which is probably why those experts on child rearing insist children need routine. <laughs> Doubt that. They need routine to get them ready for the business of having a job that no matter how interesting it begins, it becomes boring once you get good at it. I worked in the laundry once. I and this lady got so good, we would sleep standing up, feeding sheets into the mangle. Boss finally told us that it made everybody else feel more comfortable if we actually opened our eyes while we worked. <laughs> Bitch. I started making up stories in my mind to kill the boredom. Once, I twisted the sheet up so it would get tangled, and I put it, and the assistant manager would have to climb on top of the machine and untangle the mess. Ooh, it was hot up on top of that mangle. 
He was sweating buckets <laughs> <laughs> trying to get it all started up again. And we just watched. I, it was like having an extra break. One day I realized I was spending one third of my life doing something I hated. And I walked out, never came back. Work is terrible, so I don't do it very often. Just enough to stay alive. Isn't it funny how everyone seems to think they are editors? <laughs> the other day, my friend got a hold of a piece I was working on because I left it out in the open. I was cooking dinner for the two of us. She took it upon herself to find a red pen and mark it all up, marking spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes. She decided I should be using the word great instead of good. <laughs> By the time I got the piece back, it isn't even the same story. Well, it was my story, as in, I'm the one who first wrote on the paper, but now every third word is different. The sentences have been switched around, and what I had in the conclusion was pushed into the introduction. <laughs> then she has the nerve to smile and hand it back and say, there you go, I've changed a few things to make it tons better. I also fixed the grammatical errors and spelling mistakes. Think nothing of it. She looks at me as if I should smile back and say, Oh, jolly gee, thanks. You're the best friend ever. All I needed was someone to edit my story, my short story. Now I can go over what you edited and fix another copy. Of course, with all your genius changes, then send it off to the publisher. You're a great friend. <laughs> he did not realize that unless specifically asked to look at it, and even then, only when asked to actually edit it, should she be marking it up or even commenting on how it is written? If you're just a normal person, a non-writer, and I ask you to read my piece, it is probably because I need to hear a great job. This is amazing. Mm. What I heard when she handed this scratched up manuscript to me was a screaming can't. Mm. You are not good enough. Now I have to fight all night to restore the work to its original state and convince myself that I can do this, that I am worthy of this work, that the censors don't own me. Looking it over, fuck. Here's a whole pile of shit I was gonna send off to the editor. I don't need another censor in my life. Friends, disres disrespectfully, fuck off when it comes to my work. I was lost once. I was trying to find this warehouse, Sears liquidation warehouse. I was with my daughter. We could see the warehouse from the highway. We would take the logical next exit, and the warehouse was nowhere to be seen. Back on the highway, back off the highway, lost, back on the highway. Isn't the definition of insanity using the same method to try and achieve a different result, she asks? Yeah, I answer, <laughs> and right now, I'm about totally insane. I felt like I was going to lose it. We asked directions from a half dozen people and they led us to finding a half dozen new ways of getting lost. Talk about morons. They gave directions like they actually knew how to get us there. But not a single set of those directions worked. I parked the car, made fun of the morons we had asked directions of. We had a good laugh over my rude and mean jokes about them. Relieved, I wondered out loud why we kept asking people how to get to Sears Warehouse. Because we want to shop there, my daughter says. Yeah, I say. What street is it on? I don't know, she answers, mm -hmm. the frustration threatening to boil up again. That's it. What's it? We should be looking for the street on a map. I phone Sears, find out the street it's on, go to a garage and look at a map and we found it. They might have been morons, but we were listening to them for hours, chronically asking the wrong question. It's like that. It's like someone trying to correct your work. It's like, I'm lost again. Ha ha ha!
Friends who think they are editors bring up the worst in me. You know, when I was in my 20s, I met the man of my dreams. He was handsome, tall, and slender, and the way he talked to me made me feel so light. He was such a beautiful man. I met him at the coffee shop, the one just down from my flat. That no-name old place was always good for finding a nice bit of man, or woman, to ogle while I sip my coffee. The couches were so worn in, the leather was cracked, and the pillow stained with coffee spills. I was there one lazy afternoon watching the snowfall and the busy work, people trudging through the snowbanks. I saw him across the street and watched him come towards the coffee shop. He was wearing those brown medium height boots, like the army kind of ones punky boys wear. He had a pair of black pants on paired with a well-cut black ja jacket. He looked clean. I've always liked that, a clean man. One who looks like he owns a shower and knows how to use the laundry room in his building. <laughs> for, reasons other than, for reasons other than one of those quickie pit stops when you don't want to go all the way up the stairs because you are in such a romantic rush and you just need to do it right then and there. He came, he came into the shop and stomped the snow off his boots. I like that. He was facing away from me. He went to the counter and ordered a hazelnut latte. As he waited for his drink, he grabbed a paper from the stack and gazed around the room, looking for somewhere to sit. Well, there was me, forgetting that I'm actually not invisible, staring right at him. I could see him staring at me, but stupid me, I guess I didn't actually realize it was me he was looking at. I kept right on staring. It was a long two minutes before I realized what I was doing. I blushed hard and buried my head in my book. He came over and sat with me, rumbling. Sorry, I sometimes stare off into space and daydream. I start thinking about something and it's hard for me to get my mind off of it. I just look in one place and in my mind, I'm like, la di da di da la di da <laughs> He cut me off and introduced himself. He smelt like musky gingerbread. From that moment, oh, I was his. He spoke as if, well, not like an Englishman or anything, but you know, like in a city Indian accent. <laughs> he was charming. So charming, in fact, that he charmed me right back up the street to my apartment building and right into my bed. I walked him out several hours later and stood outside my flat, smoking a cigarette. Shit, I thought. I forgot to take my pill. Ugh, maybe I am an idiot. I even need my editor to ask me if I took my pill today. That isn't the only time I fell in love. To tell the truth, I fell in love every time some handsome guy came in the room walking like he thought he had a place in this world, like he belonged, except this one time. It was Redbone. The whole band was yakking it up with me, every one of them persisting and pursuing. I felt like a goddess. But the one who was the most determined well, I just couldn't wrap my heart around him. Are you kidding me? You look like me. You even have a shag haircut like me. <laughs> Too weird. Didn't stop me from yanking his chain a little, though. I mean, if you can't spin a little yarn once in a while, what's the good of being alive? They were playing at this big concert hall. They asked all the Indians in the audience to come backstage. We did. Not that many of us, I mean, this was a $35 concert in the 70s. It took me two months to save that much scratch. They were all over me, fawning, flirting. I kept saying I had to go. It was Nemushum's birthday. Kukum would not forgive my absence. You don't know her. She has a killer look. <laughs> Who's your Mushum? Chief Dan George. I want to meet Chief Dan George. So my girlfriend says, let's all go. I am dead, so dead. I'm not entitled to invite anyone to Cookham's house. I'm not that high up in the family food chain. We arrive, Cookham is gatekeeping. I say really loud that Redbone wants to meet Mushum, sneaky. <laughs> I want to meet Redbone, Mushum says. Nookum harems, gives me the look, but she opens the door. We party all night long. Mushum on the bass fiddle, 
the boys on their guitars, as young ones all dancing, singing along, and Nookum struggling to stay mad. <laughs> gotta love the ones that got away and the ones you couldn't love too. I remember when I was pregnant with my first child, the beginning of a lifetime of censorship. Only this time I am a participant. Oh, I was not very pleased to be pregnant. I did enjoy playing with the with child card. I screamed and screamed for the father to bring me vanilla ice cream and peppermint tea all hours of the day and night. He would be furious with me for a bit, but then he'd calm down and fetch me what I had asked for. That was my favorite indulgence when I was pregnant, vanilla ice cream and peppermint tea. The father thought it was weird. You always hear about those pregnant women eating weird things like mushrooms in their cereal or pickles and peanut butter. I think I was the less crazy end of the crazy scale. I didn't mind being pregnant much either. I liked being really fat. People had to move on the bus so I could sit down. Somewhere in the middle of all this, my project suffered. Every time a project suffers, the, who do you think you are? You can't do this, comes up. It's like soup between your hands and the computer. You have a slog through the soup until you reach the computer and this extra blob in front of me shows, slows me down. I win the fight less. Half the time I never make it to the computer. Otherwise, I didn't mind being pregnant much. I think of my favorite part was wearing a bikini at the beach. Now I've never had much of a bikini body, but with my big old belly, it didn't matter. I didn't think I ever felt so beautiful lying in the sand in my yellow, purple spotted bikini with my big, huge belly and extra wide sun hat. All the time my kids were growing up, I had to fight, packing in project after project. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't really my fault either, but, but they burned time. Your creativity is going inside them and not into the story. And you know, kids ain't all that smart. So it surprised me when they finally did grow up and become interesting. <laughs> That pregnancy, as quiet, uh, as quiet the surprise to me. I didn't even realize I was pregnant until it was too late to, you know, get rid of it, damn thing. I thought it was going to ruin my life. And it did for a while until I realized I got along quite well with the little thing. We became friends. I was glad it hadn't completely ruined my life. I got lucky with all my kids. Maybe there is a good God and he knew I seriously did not like kids. That I was vain, that I was seriously only liked because, liked beautiful things because my first child had a flawless, even features. She was so beautiful that the doctor and nurses called everyone in the hospital floor over to look at her. She had a perfectly round head, perfectly TP eyebrows and golden sandy colored hair and amber honey colored skin, pouty Bridget Bordeaux lip style. Well, she still has all those things, but after your kid shits all over you, pukes on you, threatens out all your secrets, strips naked in the department store several times and throws all those tantrums, their good looks kind of take a back burner. It gets harder and harder for them to impress you, I mean, they are definitely going to crap on your parade for the first two years of their life. Then I had another, and another. So for what seems like a decade, I was wiping crap, cleaning puke, listening to gobbledygook, and waiting for them to grow a brain, learn a language, have a thought so I could actually like them. <laughs> the good news was that now I'm not queasy about anything. I remember the day that I realized I didn't actually have kids. They had me. I was their personal human. At their beck and call, singing on cue, telling stories on cue, dancing to whatever maddened tune came into their minds. I listened to the philosophy of three-year-olds for what seemed like forever. The philosopher became a joker that could never remember the whole joke, and I laughed every time kind of reminded me of the Smothers Brothers. I watched them live on my res at a hotel. Tommy Smothers 
ups and shouts out a punchline with no setup. Just a punchline. We laughed. He was just like one of my kids. It surprised me when they finally did grow up and became interesting, friendly, even the most likable of human beings. I still sit here and wonder exactly what happened, when it happened. Well, I had those Zanfan, whether I wanted them or not. Annoying bunch. They were always yelling and screaming, but I loved them. Oh, I loved them. Guess I still do. But they all wanted me to, but all they wanted me to do was tell them stories when they were young. Mommy, read to us. Tell us another story. Mommy, I like it best when you make up stories. You tell them way better than the books do. Eventually, the kids started asking me to retell them stories. I, I told them in the past. Well, I was never one for having much of a memory. The kids would hound and hound until I agreed to retell the stories. So I'd start where I could remember, and I'd try to remember all the words. But as I said, I was never one for having much of a memory, so I forgot. Big deal. That's what I thought. Those kids had minds like elephants. <laughs> they were always able to remember everything, including the bits and pieces of my stories that I myself couldn't remember. I remember saying to them, if you remember the story so bloody well, why don't I lay back and you can tell them to me? <laughs> no way, Mom, was all they would scream back at me. Well, as the years went by, it became harder and harder to remember the stories or where I left off last time. The kids did not like my fading memory. I didn't like it much either, but it kept my head free to think about things as they came. So I started writing down stories at night after they fell asleep. I'd write and write. I thought I'd die sitting in that chair night after night, coffee after coffee. I played this game with my grandchildren and my children when they were small. One of us would make up a story, then the other, and the other. We took turns. I tell ya, kids live in an imaginative state. Adults have to fight for it. <laughs> One day, we were driving down the freeway. It was winter. The wind was blowing. The snow was whirling about, nearly blinding me, and they wanted to play the game. <laughs> I have to tell you, I love my grandkids more than I ever loved my children. <laughs> Maybe all the love I felt for others, Rusty and Carrie included, was getting me ready for the loves of my life, those two little girls. I never minded disappointing my own children. No, we aren't playing that game right now, and I wouldn't play. But these were my grandchildren, and I can't bear to disappoint them, so. The snow gets in the way, I nearly drive off the road, and I still make up some story about a giraffe in the tractor trailer ahead of us, swaying back and forth in the snow. My the giraffe gets dizzy in the storm, stumbles inside the truck, the girls laugh at the dizzy giraffe, I slid a little in the snow, they don't notice, too busy laughing at the no notion of a dizzy giraffe. Then these two girls in capes steady the truck magically with their thoughts. The giraffe is relieved. He falls in love with one of the girls. They tell another story. The snow gets thicker on the road. The drivers get crazier. And I can't conjure a damn thing. So, I tell a story I told last summer. Cook em! You cheated! You already told that story before! You lose, cook em! I can't believe they remembered that piece of BS from a half a year ago. They're just four and five and I wonder about my own fading memory. Ah, uh, hell. What do I need to remember? I'm just making up shit. I do find it funny, though, this losing. If I have to lose, I don't want to lose. The one, the one thing I don't want to lose would be my grandchildren. I make up stories so that if my memory does fade, it doesn't matter. I won't run out. They don't play with me anymore. They're too old. Shit. Where are my damn slippers? My feet are cold. I can't think when my feet are cold. When I turned 30, I was not happy. In my mind, 30 was the worst age. It was the end of the fun years and the beginning of getting old. I didn't want to get old, still don't. I liked being young, doing everything the same way I had been doing it. 
I was in a rut. The can't comes up with the thought of not able being able to write. Why did I choose this? Then I remember Agatha Christie, 90 years old, dying at her typewriter, two lines left to go. That's a writer getting old with glory. That's how I want to die. I can do this. I figured it was about time I started acting my age. So for my 30th birthday, I gave in my notice at my 100-year-old apartment that was creaky, smelly, and falling apart. And I got myself a beautiful loft right in the heart of the city. It made me feel old to live in the loft, maybe because it smelled nice, there was a security guard, and my hot water always worked, even when the knob was turned really slowly. To add to my oldness, I started drinking in pubs and restaurant bars instead of going out on the town and dancing until 3 a.m. <sighs> old and single, dying alone seemed probable. I remember reading in a psychology magazine, probably at the doctor's office, that once a woman turns 28, her chances of finding love, marriage, etc., go down significantly. Bummer. I guess I did always say I wanted to be single. Maybe I didn't honestly mean it. Oh well. The loft opened a new chapter in my life. I'll accept being old if it means I'm that much closer to getting the seniors discount. Bring on the 20% off at Safeway every Tuesday and no cost tuition at the uni. May as well shack up my boots and go down to the store and buy myself a cane before I can't make it down there without one. On my way out of my beautifully painted and professionally designed loft, who do I notice but the sexiest 30-something-year-old man heading into his condo just two doors down? He smiled. Hmm, maybe 30 won't be so bad. Funny, thinking on it now, 30 was the last decade I didn't have wrinkles. It was the last decade I didn't have trouble kicking out a story. Getting old? What in the hell was I thinking? It was the last time I could really run. I mean, move. Me and my kid won the five-mile mother-daughter race. Shit. Now I'm proud if I can rise from the couch in a single move without my arms to support my fat ass. No laugh lines. Don't even know why they call them laugh lines. It's age. Old age. The skin hangs like an old, worn-out overcoat that should have been thrown out a long time ago, but it's attached can't get rid of it, it's gravity. Things start falling, heading south, but they can't drop because they're attached. Boobs, butt, legs, face, even your eyes droop. And all that eats the time you could be spending makeup, and all that eats the time you could be spending making up a new story. It's like everything is in slow motion, as though we have to wear out one cell at a time. We can't just live life full blast, skin tight as a drum, but butt perky and abs hard, then just die. No, we have to droop, to fold, to slacken, to slow down, to drag ourselves around for the last couple of decades, remembering how we used to look. Old ladies and clutches gather around and talk about how beautiful I was. Go to hell, I still am. Where did I put those teeth anyway? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and I would use all those seniors' discount cards if I could remember where the hell I put them. <laughs> Picks up manuscript and flips through the page. Shit, where is that fucking page? What's that smell? Is something burning? Shit, I left the fucking meat on the stove. <laughs> she hangs her head out the window for a while while the smoke clears and then goes back to her computer. My last kid decided she wanted to live on her own the day she turned 18. I played the concerned parent card for a little while. She was a grown woman. She could go ahead and do whatever she wanted. I gave up after a few days of bantering and told her she could go, so she went. I was never happier. Now don't get me wrong, I love my daughter. Now finally I had the chance to escape. No more doing her laundry, or cleaning up a mess that wasn't mine. No more lending money or the car. I'll have much more time to write and less pressure. Maybe I'm not losing my mind. Maybe I'm just under too much pressure. Well, that didn't actually end. 
but she was gone. I was ecstatic. By the time she was 18, I was bone weary of hearing, look, mom, look, three times a day for thousands and thousands of days. Have you any idea how mind-bending boring that can be? Kids have this button that says, everything I do is of great interest to my personal human. And so they holler out, look for the simplest, and so they holler out, look for the simplest of accomplishments. One morning, she is sewing up a tea towel. Come on, a tea towel. It has only two edges to sew. You fold, iron, and sew. That's it. When she was done, she says, look, I have one of those WC field size hangovers, rum, Cuban rum, lots of it, pounding nails in my brain and out my eyes. The last thing I want to do is open them and look, but I can't not look. Mothers have a different kind of button. It says, look, 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 you have to look. I do, and it feels like my brain is going to explode, but I smile with the best dishonest excitement in my voice. I say, that's great. I sit down and think about Tony the Tiger saying, that's great, on TV, and suddenly feel incredible sympathy for him. And I can't even use the shit in the story. I remember when I first felt my body start changing. It was weird, I wasn't used to it. At first I began to feel my limbs getting stiffer. At first I thought it was the flu. It must be the flu, can't be age. But it didn't stop there. I found it harder to get up off the couch, to peel myself out of the car, and to wedge myself out of my computer chair. It slowly became harder to walk and even reach items on the top shelf. After that, I noticed I smelled different. I didn't smell like incense and organic soaps anymore. I smelled old, funny, kind of like the smell of fridge walls. I wondered if other people could smell it or if, if it was just me. I was too afraid to ask, how humiliating. I noticed I wasn't thinking the same. I used to have a do anything whenever I want kind of mindset. Now I realized I wasn't going out after dark because I was scared. How odd. I used to walk everywhere all through the night. I can't go out collecting stories at night anymore. Oh yeah, I used to go out and collect stories while the kids were sleeping. Oh yeah, I remember that now. When I did haul myself out for a walk in the daylight, I couldn't walk as fast. It doesn't seem as though too many stories are out walking around in the daytime. At least I wasn't finding any. I would lose my breath and my feet would start pounding worse than Nushushum after dancing the Red River Jig. I would have to sit down to take a rest just a block or two from home. Now I have to plan my walks, my bus trips, everything. I can't go for more than an hour without a bathroom. Man, am I ever sorry I laughed at old folks who wet themselves now. I was going to visit my old friend. She forgot, senile old biddy, Or maybe it was me who had the wrong day. What day was I supposed to drop by? No matter, she wasn't there. I had to go to the bathroom, bad. I run up the street, the cafe is closed. I run down the street, nothing, nothing is open. I'm looking for a dumpster, an old concrete stump, a dark alley, anything. I see this big cardboard box jump, and I jump in it and drop my drawers. Damn, there's the owner of the box apologizing then hollering at me. Something like, well, now you can tear it up yourself, lady. Okay, I say, have you got a Kleenex? He throws in a paper towel. Thank God, I hate drip dry. That was the worst, and I was only 49. I'm not looking forward to getting any older. I looked in the mirror the day I turned 50, and I realized my face was a road map of wrinkles, and my hair was almost entirely silver. Who is this person, I thought to myself. It had been such a long time since I stared into my reflection and actually took the time to see. I've always been in such a rush, slapping on makeup and running out the door. I wish I had taken more time. I wish I had taken more pictures. If I had taken the time to look at myself more often, would I have been able to pinpoint the exact moment a wrinkle began to appear? Would I have remembered it? 
Maybe if I did, I would have known when to switch my moisturizer to an anti-wrinkle cream. <laughs> Maybe that would have stopped my face from being driven on. I pondered over dyeing my hair. Is it worth it? I wondered. My own mother always said she didn't want to dye her hair once it had gone white because she didn't want to grow back she didn't want it to grow back at the roots and look like a skunk. That's a valid point. But maybe I could just dye it right away and not have to worry about that? Nah, I know I'm too lazy. I guess I'll just have to accept it. This whole getting old. Maybe there will be good parts, like sitting in a rocking chair and yelling at the kids down the street. I'm okay with that. I could use a good sit down anyway, so it'll be good practice. Menopause is the biggest sensor that you can't even do anything about. I remember it well. That was a fun year, or 10. For no reason, my menses stopped. No warning, they just stopped. I had my tubes tied, so that would make pregnancy either a small miracle or a danger. The doctor tells me it's menopause. What's that? Well, it is different for everybody. Good answer, he obviously didn't know. Can't focus, can't concentrate, can't even conjure. I had so many projects I started and never finished from that decade. And now I can't even remember where I was going with half of them, or I'd finish it now. Oh, I like that idea. I remember being so hot that I would run outside in the middle of cooking dinner, wearing only my robe and slippers, and stood in the snowbank. I would rub loose snow on my chest and run my cold hands through my hair. Once my daughter's friend came over to visit, and there I was, middle of a hot flash, bathing in the snow in front of my house. I said, hello. She laughed. Well, at least my suffering was able to bring someone joy. God, I was so hot. That was the winter I got frostbite on my toes. Parts of my feet still don't have feeling. Damn menopause, which reminds me. Are my slippers on? Not sure what I was thinking as my mother lay sick and near to death. Maybe I thought I would be one of those miracles and pass through menopause without any trouble at all. I would get so angry at people all the time. I was terrified of alienating my publisher. It seemed no matter what they did, I became furious. More than one occasion, I had to hang up the phone because I would start a rant. I would be relaxing and watching TV. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I would be yelling and screaming at my daughter because she put a fork in with the spoons in the drawer. I knew as I was yelling that it was ridiculous for me to be upset at her, but I just couldn't stop. There it is, I can't even be sane. I can't trust myself to talk sanely to the publisher. I can't trust myself to conjure the next story. Damn menopause. I remember thinking I was pregnant for a while because that time of the month didn't come around. Glad that wasn't the case. No way did I want another kid. To add to my concern, there was the loss of libido and it started to get a little dry down there. I was happy it was just menopause. Just menopause? The fucking mood swings were swinging, my hair was falling out, and I was having difficulty concentrating. I remember thinking, this thing is going to kill me. Then one day, I felt hysteria coming at me like a truck. I mean, like one of those big transport trucks. I do a check. The rent is paid, there is food in the fridge, I still have a job, I own my own transport, my kids are all grown up and healthy. What the fuck do I have to be hysterical about? Nothing came up. I noticed some weight gain, and that's when I thought, that's it. I marched right down to the public library and what did I find? Hardly anything. There were no books I could relate to. I was furious. Maybe that was just the menopause, but I was so mad. I looked at bookstores, but there was nothing written yet. I did find one, a Christian woman's guide to menopause. Her take was that it meant your sex life was over, and so I could now turn my life over to God. Presumably my lust too. Well, that's no fun. 
Someone else wrote a whole book complaining about how there are no books about it. <laughs> My sentiments exactly. But that was no help. I did what a lot of women must have done over the centuries. Weather it and make other people suffer. <laughs> Lost a couple of husbands. Nearly killed one of them. Not that he didn't deserve it. What a dog. He thought that cheating was part of living. One time, I'm feeling hysteria coming on, and one of his skanks calls me. Dumb bitch is crying. I guess he left her hanging, told her he loved her, and that he was leaving me, and of course he was lying. Who wants to give up their home no matter how bad it is? No man wants to haul all his stuff from one place to another for a piece of tail he can get without living with her. For guys like that, one woman is as good as the next. But us women, we never seem to get it. We pick up some dude who is still wired to someone else. She finds out, tosses him out, and guess who takes him in? Old second time around. Should have known better. That was how I got him in the first place. He was cheating on someone else. I figured it out, but that isn't what this story is about. He was sitting at my table, eating food I cooked, and his girlfriend is shrieking in my ear, crying that he doesn't love me. Duh, I say, but that isn't the point. The point is, he doesn't love anybody. He's a damn narcissist that is getting gone tonight as soon as you stop screaming in my ear. I hang up on her. I go over to the table, grab the plate of hot food, jam it in his face run over to the bedroom and start tossing his stuff out the window. I am laughing as I watch it drop three stories down and land in a puddle on the road. What the fuck do you think you're doing, he hollers. I grab him by the scruff and struggle to throw him out the same window, but he got away. Ran for the hall, skipped down the stairs and out the door, all the time screaming, crazy bitch! Maybe I am because I could not for the life of me stop laughing. Next morning, though, the silence was deafening. I blamed menopause. Could have handled it, but the hysteria was right there, and the beast had to be appeased. My mother died when I was still 41. I was still thin, athletic, dancing, and feeling invincible. I didn't want to be an orphan. It just worked out that way. Well, I wasn't exactly an orphan. My father was still around. But he and I weren't that close, and now he has Alzheimer's. While he recognizes I am beautiful, he doesn't know I'm his daughter anymore, which on one of my good days can be quite comical. I did not think to ask her about aging, and now I'm nearly 60. I can't ask her, and my dad is a very scary example of old age. There are some of the, these are some of the things I wish we had talked about. First, there is this perilous desire to just sit. According to doctors, if you sit, you will get fat. I can vouch for that. I used to try and get my mom to at least go for walks. Exercise, mom, you will live longer. Yes, yes, and given all the work my life has been about, that should be a barrel of fun. Okay, I, I get it. I sit as much as I can, and I've gained 50 extra pounds. The doctors are right. Sit and get fat. I write for a living, so the stiffening of my butt slowed my production and up my insecurity. My arms and my shoulders join the general betrayal. Sit and you shall pay in more than pounds. I began to procrastinate. I miss deadlines. I have to beg publishers to understand so I don't have to pay back the advances. I should never have picked this life. And now I've got this project that I can't even find the doorway into. I feel so tired, always. If I dare to rest for more than an hour in a, walking, in a waking state, I stiffen. I only want to sit, but sitting has become a near criminal act. If you actually exercise without stretching, you invite not just stiffness, but a major seizure. These days, instead of writing, I sew. Not because it is my only talent, but it is one of the few things that keeps me sitting. It's mindless. Is my mind going? After sewing in front of the television for several hours, I lumber. 
stagger, or sometimes even crawl to bed. Glad I live alone. The last problem is the most horrific. I'm losing my short-term memory. Where are my glasses? Who am I supposed to see? What did you say your name was? What is my name? Where am I? How the hell did I get to live this long? What am I supposed to be doing? And then some ass puts the clock on speed dial. That was right about the time I started wearing reading glasses, which I now buy by the dollar. I used to buy them at the drugstore, but then after sitting on several pairs, losing dozens, I wised up. Stopped buying the $20 drugstore variety. My mother did say that time goes faster when you are older. I didn't believe her, but there it was. One minute, I was 41, still thin, still dancing, still athletic. And now my much shorter, wider body and almost blind eyes squint at grown-up grandchildren. And I hardly remember it happening. I've always been slightly afraid of going crazy. Pounding her fist on the table next to her computer. I need a doorway. Someone give me a fucking doorway. I need a way into the story. I feel like it kind of runs in the family, this craziness. There are different types of crazy, there are. Pours a drink and picks up a framed picture, staring longingly. What was I doing? Oh right, I was commissioned to write about my life. Points at the picture. I think I'll start with you, you bastard. Typing on her computer. The thing is, is that you would never know it, because I would never say it but you break my heart a bit more every single day. Opened up, the stream of white light floods my eyes, and all I can think of is you. The words are hard to express. It's been so long, you would never even know. But the small little remarks, they tear at my soul. I didn't walk away, I screamed to stay. But you confused our love story with the one of hate. There was no hate, it was all so long ago. Typing on her computer. I'm sure I let it happen. It crawled up so slow. But I guess piece by piece, I let my sorrow grow. How awkward to say it now. To bring up all that past to say I never let go. I couldn't do it. There's a reason I couldn't then, but I've forgotten what it is. And now there's years of bricks built between why I really shouldn't now. It is awkward to be so brutally honest to mention something that you'll never know, to mention it to anyone would be comforting. The pain would remain hidden, the feelings never fully released. I could stay in my cage to hide my incessant rage from the reality that is ringing in my ears. You'll never know it. I did it for you. You think I did it for me? Well, fuck you too. You know what you're doing with every typed word. You're ripping my heart out. You've killed my spirit, my last glimpse of hope. You slice through the muscle, the veins, my throat. You knew what you were doing. You knew it all along. I didn't have to tell you. You saw through to my bones. Typing on a computer. You read it like a book, the pain on my face, but you couldn't stop running, spitting at my grace. You ran so fast, you ran so hard, that when you stopped running, you knew you'd taken it too far. You thought you had escaped my grasp. You looked back and laughed. You'll never catch me now, stupid little bitch. But didn't you know I had tied my veins to your heart with my hair? Your heart wouldn't beat without thinking of me. You stretched my veins so thin, but they'll never break. The curse I've cast, maybe now you can see. You will love me forever too. I'm fixed within your soul. You'll always have a touch of, I do, I love you. But you wouldn't know it. Your glasses are too dirty to see through. The stupidity you seethe was not my curse unto you. You cursed yourself. You wrote your own lines. You carved your own name with twine into mine. You ripped the skin, the curse bled through, and I thought it was me, what I had done to you. You seething creature, you slimy swine, how quickly you cast your spell over mine. 
without my noticing, you do not play fair. You've broken my heart. There's nothing left there. To audience. He was the one I wanted to keep. He took my youth. Anyone who gets the best of you, you never want to let go. I read somewhere that your emotions are actually more closely connected to your kidneys, but it doesn't sound sexy to say you broke my kidneys, so we say <laughs> you broke my heart. Well, obviously not. I mean, I am still here, and the old ticker keeps on going. Just the emptiness at night nags a little. The thought that he didn't want me when I was at my best scratches at me, whittling me away a little at a time. Wish he had been a bigger asshole. I look around inside what is left of my mind, trying to find some horrific thing about him, but there is nothing. He just didn't want me. I guess that is why they call it free choice. No one has to love you. That is the only truth about love there is. Where is that bottle? Ah, Cuban rum cures everything. I can do it. I can fucking do it. Holding up the framed picture. You finally got useful. Think I'll put on an old Patsy Cline pain song and just enjoy my broken heart. Oh shit, I spilled half of it. Now I'm going to listen to Patsy half sober. Huh. Ain't that a bucket of shit? Never mind, I'm on a roll. 